A big welcome to Dr. Marilyn Cochran Smith, Professor of Teacher Education for Urban Schools at Boston College. My name is Joy Espold, and I'm a doctoral candidate in UC Berkeley's Graduate School of Education, studying critical teacher learning and education. It is my deep honor to be with you here today. Thank you so much for joining us to talk about your reflections on and predictions for teacher education. The time allotted for this interview could be filled entirely recounting your numerous and significant significant contributions to the field of teacher education as your 10 books, 200 plus articles and chapters and national and international awards over your 40 years as scholar and practitioner have truly shaped the field of education. Across the years, your work demonstrates commitment to centering teaching for social justice and against the grain and research as practice based. From policy to practitioners to my own research, the influence of your work has truly been transformative. I'm excited for our conversation today. So let's dive in. Our first question is what changes stand out to you since you began in teacher education? Well, I'm glad you said um, it's been 40 years because I, I have been in teacher education a long time. So there've been a lot of changes. I actually taught my first teacher education course to teacher candidates at a university in 1978. So it has been more than 40 years. So a lot has changed. I think um, one thing to mention is that at that time in 1978, I think um, uh, people didn't pay so much attention to teacher education. It's even been described by some people as sort of a backwater uh, enterprise, at least in terms of policy. It was handled by middle to lower level people at the policy level. Uh, and there just wasn't a whole lot of attention to what was happening with teacher education. Then along came A Nation at Risk in 1983. Um, and with its uh, alarming predictions, which we're all pretty familiar with, even people as young as you, know that that was a real game changer. And people really started to pay attention. The predictions were that if we kept going the way we were going, the, the country wouldn't be able to compete uh, and so on. So it really brought a lot of attention. And one of the things it brought attention to was the whole idea of teacher quality. And we were moving into this global era where uh, increasingly we were talking about educational issues internationally and at a global level. People were arguing that we were now in the new knowledge economy. Uh, we were gonna have to be sure the kids we were preparing in schools could compete and uh, bring along with them the US so we would have a robust global economy. So that was a huge change. It brought a new policy paradigm. It wasn't just a nation at risk, but many people have suggested that was a key galvanizing event. So now what do we, what do we, what do we have? In the 90s and well into the 2000s through the whole first decade for sure and most of the next decade, um, in addition to this global unprecedented attention to teacher quality, policy started to change and two policy tools really emerged. One was accountability and one was deregulation. Um, now there was a lot of other stuff going on in teacher education too. I'm not talking about just reform agendas. I'm talking about what became the policy tools. And so we had all sorts of approaches to accountability. Of course, we had state level accountability for every teacher education program, but we also had the federal government get involved a little, little later than that. We had um, private organizations getting involved in teacher education accountability. We had real changes in national programmatic accreditation. So that was the shift from NCATE, which had been around a long time and then TIAC came on the scene and then they merged and then they became CAPE. And so, I mean, and then eventually AQEP entered as well. So a whole era, what I have called an era with the colleagues of mine that wrote our book on accountability, this whole big era of accountability, which was market uh, inspired uh, to keep us competitive in the global economy. Um, and much of that, uh, was imposed on teacher education, but not all of it. This came from the field as well. So we had new uh, national level available assessments 
uh, teacher performance assessments. States, different states developed their own and we had uh, the national ones as well. So all kinds of accountability. That's one big change since I started as a teacher educator in 1978. Some of the impact has been good, but much of it has been problematic, I think. And then the second uh, policy tool that I mentioned was deregulation. So in the 90s, there were all sorts of debates about what the research on teacher education said. Is there a one best route for people to enter? How do we know? Can we see its impact on kids' test scores? Other people said, you can't look at it that way. That doesn't make sense. There's so many other factors, but deregulation was debated for quite a while. But in the end, the forces that wanted deregulation won. Uh, almost every state, I think with one exception at this point in time, have uh, alternate routes available for entry into teaching. Some states have many more than others, but deregulation has had a huge impact uh, on teacher education. It's, it's a much more crowded, um, rapidly changing competitive field. Um, later in that, uh, in that time period or in the 90s in the 2000s, we also began to focus more on practice. And some people have called this the practice turn in teacher education, but that had all sorts of um, all sorts of instantiations that are very different from one another. One is certainly uh, teacher residencies. There are a lot of urban teacher residencies, a few rural teacher residencies. Many of them have been initiated by universities, but others are have not been. They're school initiated or other organizations. So urban teacher residencies were designed to put more of the emphasis on practice, more time in schools, upfront time in schools. That's been a big change. And I think people are still trying to figure out what does it mean to move more of teacher education into the schools? And it's not just a matter of teaching a course in a school. What else does that mean? Uh, but that's not the only uh, instantiation of the practice turn. We had a big focus on core practices, which also has multiple iterations and controversy that goes with it. So I think um, those, I think, are the big changes since I started 43 or whatever it is years ago. Um, this new education policy paradigm that brought with it unprecedented attention to teacher quality, deregulation, accountability, and a move toward practice. There are other things too. Um, and I don't mean to suggest there weren't people working on social justice and equity issues, myself included. Uh, but those, I don't think, those certainly weren't the major policy uh, tools. And I'll say more about equity and social justice in relation to one of your other questions, I think. But let me stop there for that one. Thank you. With that foundation, um, where do you see teacher education going? It certainly builds on what I was just saying. So one of the um, directions of teacher education is that it has become a global uh, enterprise and it is of interest globally. Um, so, I mean, we've had international journals for some time. I don't remember when Tate was founded, but it's been around for a while. So that has brought international perspectives. Um, but I think since we live in this world where it's so easy to communicate on Zoom, for example, we now have all sorts of international collaborations and international questions. One of, I've been on a couple panels recently where the question is, what does teacher quality look like in this country, in that country, and then across we have efforts like Linda Darling Hammond's Empowering Educators, just trying to look at the systems that uh, different countries use for teacher quality. So that's one of the directions teacher education is going in now. Um, it, that direction has been around for a while, but I think that will continue. And there's some really rich and interesting international collaborations. Uh, for example, there, there's been some very interesting collaboration among countries that have um, long histories of uh, war 
And so Ireland, Northern Ireland has collaborated with Israel, um, interesting kinds of collaborations. And I think we all learn from each other. So that's one direction. It's well established and I think it has lots more developments. The second thing I would say, and this builds on what I was saying in answer to the first question, really is about diversification. Partly with the amount of deregulation we have and with so many alternative routes and so many new providers, we really see a great deal of diversification. It's not the case that we can say anymore, as people used to say, that, yeah, there's a lot of teacher ed programs that they're all pretty much the same. It, I think that's really not the case anymore. Um, we, have, um, we have brick and mortar institutions for sure, but we also have online programs. Uh, Many of us old timers, I think years ago said, well, you can't do teacher education online. That doesn't make any sense. How could you possibly do that? Well, people have figured out ways to do it uh, well before the pandemic, which has just um, bolstered that whole effort, I think. So we've got this whole array of large and small online, traditional, school-based, practice-based, all different sorts of programs. We also see, um, I think, a, a move toward a highly specific teacher preparation. Some people call it situation specific teacher preparation. So I think we are moving away from the kind of generic uh, teacher preparation. Now, for years, we've concentrated on subject matter since Lee Shulman's work. Uh, people have tried to think about pedagogical content knowledge, not just general pedagogical knowledge, subject matter and general knowledge of pedagogy, but what does it mean when those things come together? What do you need to know? So we've had that for a long time, I think, uh, but we're also moving toward um, preparation for urban schools, preparation for uh, schools where there's a focus on science and math and technology. So I think we are moving toward uh, the idea that we have to pay a lot of attention to the context that we're preparing people for. One of the things that uh, I have been studying for the last four years are new graduate schools of education that do teacher preparation. Now, this is very controversial. And I am not here to say, I think this is the greatest thing since sliced bread. What we're trying to do in our study is understand what these new graduate schools of education are doing, um, how they conceptualize teacher education, how they enact it, how they're organized as institutions. Um, and one of the things we have found that we have identified 11 new graduate schools of education in the US and those are uh, new organizations that prepare teachers, they don't just recruit them and get them into classrooms, they prepare them. And they grant master's degrees, but they are not affiliated with universities. So they are the degree granting organization themselves. And it's a very interesting study, I think. Um, but one of the things we see with those new graduate schools at the, is that they have highly specialized missions. So unlike my university at Boston College, we have early childhood, elementary, secondary, we're preparing people at the secondary level in five or six different subject areas. We have special education, multiple uh, approaches there. But some of these NGSEs are preparing people just for, for example, Spizzato Graduate School of Education, which originated in the MATCH teacher residency program that some people know in Boston. It is intended to prepare people for what they call high achieving, high poverty schools. It has also been called no excuses schools, but they've moved away from that terminology a little bit because it's certainly been criticized quite a lot. But, and I'm not saying whether I think that approach is good or bad. What I'm saying is we see increasingly uh, teacher preparation programs that are preparing people for one kind of school or to teach with one particular approach or to teach one very specific subject area 
in a particular kind of school. So this diversification and specialization, I think, is uh, another um, direction uh, in which teacher education is moving. Great. The next question is what needs to happen in teacher education? So this is where I wanna talk about equity and social justice. Um, and I wanna make it very clear that I am not saying that there haven't been people already working on this for a long time. Uh, there have been people working on this since multicultural education uh, began, which was in the 1970s. So this has been around a long time. But one of the things that I think is happening and a, a colleague and I have written about this actually, is that we see the words equity and social justice sort of everywhere in the field. We see it in all the programs, but we also see it in policy uh, statements sometimes. We see it in accreditors in some of their big umbrella language, but often it's not clarified. It's not, um, unpacked, it's not defined. And so it's if, if a word becomes sort of available and used anywhere and everywhere, it tends not to mean as much as it might mean. So one of the things I think that needs to happen in teacher education is that we need to do a lot more work on theorizing and clarifying and elaborating what we mean when we say teacher education for equity or teacher education for social justice. Because I think a lot of people walk around with just a vague meaning. Well, it means fairness. It means, um, means changing things. Um, one of the things that, um, well, let me say one other thing, a colleague of and of mine and I, Emily Reagan, just did this past year a big paper on teacher preparation, evaluation, and equity. When we started out, we didn't start out with a focus on equity. We started out, and we were commissioned to do this by the National Academy of Education. We started out trying to do a paper about best practice, and I put that in quotation marks, in teacher preparation evaluation. And we were looking at the big reports, the big policy statements or policy proposals between 2010 and now, so over about a 10 year period. What have these big organizations um, said about best practice for evaluation? And we, when we say evaluation, we really were referring to accreditation, evaluation, accountability, assessment. And what we found is that most of what was being proposed did not focus on equity. And as a matter of fact, did not even talk about it very much, except maybe in a very general statement at the beginning. And so as we were analyzing all these reports and documents, and these were documents from organizations like the Council for Chief State School Officers. Uh, APA did a big report about what teacher education should do. Um, there were many of these reports. We found 20. Um, only a few um, made equity central. And the few that we located, one was in the work of Kevin Kumashiro uh, and the EDGE group, which you may know, the Educators for Educators for Justice and Equity, EDGE, E-D-J-E, I believe is how they do it, and my own work with colleagues about uh, accountability. The rest tended to work from a perspective where equity was sort of assumed to be a byproduct of evaluation. So if we evaluated all teacher preparation programs in the same way, and we tried to make sure all teacher candidates were prepared to engage in similar practices and had similar knowledge. And we would know that by using standard evaluation tools or by using value added assessments that evaluated teacher education programs according to the test scores of the students 
of the eventual students of the teacher candidates. If we did those things in, a, in the same way, then we could redistribute teacher quality because we could assume if everybody was assessed in the same way and their program uh, was assessed positively, then we could assume that all kids were gonna get similarly effective teachers because they had had the same kind of assessment and they had risen, you know, they had passed whatever those assessments were, then equity would sort of come along because we could say we have teachers who've been evaluated in the same way in all classrooms. And we raised a lot of questions about that. Uh, it, that's a sort of a redistributive model of justice. We'll prepare people, we'll assess them in the same way, and then we'll re redistribute because everybody will get quality teachers this way. We raised a lot of questions about that and we, um, we used a distinction that I have made with my uh, colleagues who wrote Reclaiming Accountability between thin and strong equity, uh, where thin has primarily this uh, equal idea that equity is equal, doing the same thing. And strong equity uh, is a much more complex notion that involves redistribution, certainly, but much more than that. And so it involves repre the representation of multiple voices of communities that have been marginalized in the goals of schools in the first place, in the goals of teacher education programs. Um, so it, it involves redistribution as well as representation, as well as recognition of the knowledge traditions of minoritized groups and other communities. And then the fourth R, we had four R's there. The fourth R is reframing, which is really rethinking and reframing notions that people tend to either throw around or implicitly uh, work with about colorblindness and meritocracy and access. Um, and so uh, this is one of the places where I think we really need to go with teacher education. We need to do that hard work of saying, what do we mean by this? And how could we do teacher education for equity if the groups that are evaluating teacher education aren't paying attention to equity. And this is actually consistent with a movement in the field of evaluation, which is a cross-disciplinary field. There's a sizable group within that field who are working very explicitly uh, on the notion of evaluation and equity. So I think teacher education needs to get involved in that way. And, and that's only a piece of it. We need to do much more than evaluation. We need to do program revision, curriculum revision, et cetera. Could have that conversation all day long. Um, but let's move to our last question. Um, what do you wish you would have known um, prior to or as you were learning to be a teacher educator? So again, this goes back a long, long way. And when I taught my first teacher education course, I was just beginning my own doctoral program. So I had been a teacher for six years. I had a master's degree, but I, and I had a master's degree in um, language, language arts and reading. Um, I had not been exposed much to critical perspectives. Um, I didn't have a theory at all or a framework for thinking about questions about equity or inequity or the um, policies and practices that produce and reproduce inequity. I didn't, I didn't have that at the beginning. I had a gut feeling about um, the need for change. And I had a gut feeling that things were not the way they should be. Um, but I really didn't have that kind of framework myself. So I wish I had had critical perspectives right from the beginning. I developed them, I think, early on because my doctoral work gave me the opportunity to read a lot of fabulous work. And at that time, uh, critical theory uh, was really just emerging in education. Qualitative research was just emerging. My dissertation at University of Pennsylvania was among the, the first group of dissertations that were allowed to be qualitative. And we had some of the leaders in the field at Penn. So that was a really wonderful opportunity. 
another thing I really wish I had known. I wish I had a, much more of a sense about the major role that schools play in teachers' education and teachers' experience and what they do with all those ideas and, and uh, practices they hear about and learn about in teacher ed programs. I, I think I had a focus way too much on teachers and teachers could really change things. And I still believe teachers can be agents of change, but only working with others. So early on in my very early days as a teacher educator, I don't think I realized the need to work at the school level and what a powerful impact the school had on teachers' work. Um, and I think we know that over years and years of research now, uh, but I don't think we had connected teacher preparation research and scholarship and practice to school research and practice and scholarship. Uh, so I wish I'd known that. I think I, I'm proud of the um, programs I worked on in teacher education, the one I did at Penn for that I initiated and, and did for more than a decade, student teachers as researching teachers, which put inquiry at the center and social justice at the center. And we worked really closely with cooperating teachers. And I think we, um, I think we did a good job of trying to recognize and build on their knowledge and not work from the perspective that the university had the knowledge and teachers had something else, I don't know, experience. Um, but we did not uh, early on recognize enough the role of the school uh, and work with school leaders as well. We did a little bit, but I wish we had, I wish I'd known more about that um, at the beginning and been able to um, sort of have a, a more of a collaborative cross practitioner kind of approach uh, from the beginning, because I, I think we now know that schools are just central in uh, what happens with teachers, especially new teachers, what happens to them when they get out to schools. Um, and I think if we had, well, I, I think I could have done a better job as a teacher educator if I had had a better understanding um, of that. Great. Thank you so much for talking with us today and sharing your reflections on for teacher education. It has been an honor to share this space with you. Thank you. You're a good listener. <laughs> Thanks. Well, I, it's, you're a captivating speaker and um, <laughs> I've really, yeah, it's, it's fun to get to hear you talk about your work and reflect on it as I've um, yeah, been reading it. So um, it's been an honor. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.